Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Then we're done. Okay, so I think we got half an hour now, including questions, and we'll see. I'll try to save some, some space for that at the end. Uh, if I'm not able to do that, then please come and grab me afterwards. Um, okay, so the title of this talk is uh, JS from Good to Great. It's a pun on the good parts. Uh, we're so in love with the good parts. We can make it better. We can make it great, I think. Um, but it's really an ode to assert, to be honest. So it should be equally applicable if you're a Ruby or Python guy, whatever you are, uh, and don't do much of JS. Can we just do a quick poll here? So who is programming JS kind of, if not daily, then at least on a regular basis? Okay, who's doing Python? Ruby? Okay. Uh, C++? Okay. All right. Good. So I'm going to start up by saying that, you know, correct code is great. Obviously, right? That's what we are striving for all the time, to write correct code. What does that mean? It means writing code that works as intended, right? It executes as we want in a program to ex execute, and it does so flawlessly. Code that crashes needs improvement. It's clearly not perfect. It's clearly not optimal yet, because it crashes. Uh, so it can't be um, correct perfect yet. But at least it crashes, so that we as programmers are notified that there is an issue. And while we are in development mode, we can then fix it. So it's kind of a good thing, too. But here's the thing. Incorrect code um, that keeps on running, that is a recipe for disaster. That is what we should avoid at all costs. And I don't know why, but we don't tend to talk about this very much. And we are talking, you know, some, at least like our managers, tend to think that, you know, crashing code, that's a really bad thing. Ah, you have a crash there. But it's like, if I can choose between having incorrect code that crashes so that I'm aware of the problem and can fix it, at least in development, and having incorrect code that just keeps on running, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm pretty sure what I'm going to pick any day of the week. Um, so what I'm saying is that fail fast, that is key to robust programs. And fail fast, we hear that all the time when we, when we hear people talk about like these huge complicated systems where you have redundancy and everything, you really build everything to fail, um, or to be able to fail and just gracefully come back up again. But I think it's really um, key to robust programs for more or less any kind of programming we do, at least, at least if we apply it with some some intelligence. Uh, so we should be able, hopefully, to go back to our managers in the future and say, hey, boss, crashing, that's a good thing. Um, of course, our programs are rarely self-improving. So just because they, they happen to crash, they don't automatically fix themselves. So another key to robust programs is getting the code right. So if not the first time, then we need to be able to, to at least iterate on that. But let's admit it, um, we make coding mistakes all the time. And so when I started out programming, that was two decades ago, um, I, I guess I thought like my, the first two years when I did basic, you know, the mistakes I do, the silly mistakes, I'm going to learn things soon. You know. Soon I'm going to know this shit, so, so I'm going to do no more, no more mistakes. The thing is here now, 20 years later, I still do a lot of mistakes. The people I look up to the most in the programming industry, if we can say it so, they do a lot of mistakes all the time. Stupid mistakes, you know, silly little mistakes, and they do big mistakes, design mistakes. Um, we all do, and it, we should just, unless we can really admit that, I think we, we're going to have an issue of being able to correct that, um, or to handle that at least. A bit more, you know, on a funny side, uh, we even make mistakes when we are troubleshooting code. You know, when we are trying to debug code, we know that there's an issue. Uh, we should be, I mean, totally focused on not making any mistakes at those times, right? Why do we make mistakes? Because, you know, we just do that. And, and the reason for this, or many, of course, but, but we, what I found, at least in my program, and I think it applies to many people's program, is that programming today is really a lot about relying on assumptions. Um, why is that? Why don't we just know shit? And why do we need to assume things? Well, I would like to say, you know, it's kind of like Facebook, you know, these Facebook relationships, it's complicated. Uh, today's systems are really complex, right? Few of us have the brain capacity and the patience to be able to understand each and every, every level of, of the abstraction stack that we are using, right? If you really think about it, look at the CPUs, the processors. I used to do a lot of assembly programming uh, back in the old 16-bit days on the Atari ST. That was really easy, Motorola 68K. It's really easy. Um, you had an instruction set, and you could easily figure out how things were executed, how many cycles an instruction took. There were no caches at all on that machine. Today, the instruction set of like an x86 or AMD64 CPU compared to how the processor actually executed, it's 
two, two totally uh, you know, different things. The number of internal registers versus external registers, different things. How things are executed out of order, it's just really hard. And then if you add all the other stuff like the memory model, that's really complicated. Few of us really understand the, net, the, you know, the, the, gore, the gore details of that. The network stack of the OS, the graphic stack, all the language details, all the language core libraries, all the frameworks we use, all the libraries we use. Few of us have the ability to really grasp all of that. So we need to rely on a lot of assumptions. And I think we do that now if we just focus on the kind of higher end of that stack, languages, libraries, and, and frameworks. We tend to rely on, on, on assumptions and you know, this fami familiarity of APIs. So if we are using Ruby and have done that for a while, and then we then come to J JS or Python or something, and we see like a, a keyword that has been reused, and it seems to be for roughly the same thing, we expect that it works you know, roughly the same. Uh, we would be very surprised if we would find that if statement worked very differently with a negated condition or whatever. So, so we find that. And, and when we, same thing with APIs. So, so in our favorite language, uh, APIs tend to kind of follow some different norms, right? Um, in the Jurassic Park way that nature will find a way, uh, we, think we seem to pick you know, the best API practices of today. And if I then go out and, and write a new library or API, or sorry, a framework, if I rely on totally different conventions for APIs, it's very likely that people will be, will be surprised when they use my code, and code quality might suffer. Um, so I guess we rely on a lot of assumptions, and we need to figure out ways to, to increase our, our brain hit rate, our assumption hit rate, because we can't, fi uh, we can't keep everything in our caches. And the issue then is that often there's this disconnect. I said it before, we, do a lot of, we make a lot of mistakes. There's often a disconnect between assumptions and reality, right? Have anyone finished Metroid? No one finished Metroid? Have anyone played Metroid? Which one? Which one? Metroid, original one, Nintendo 8-bit. You finished it? Mm. Okay, so there's a huge surprise at the end of the game. There's a disconnect between assumption and reality if you haven't played it already. So anyways, what th does this mean? It means uh, a difference between what, a program, what I think the program does, uh, that's my assumption, and what a program really does, that's the reality. These can be small things, right? It can be like an off by one. Everyone makes off by one errors once in a while, like the for loop, we keep on running one, one index too much or one too little. It can be a bigger thing, like a design mistake. We didn't really think about that, whoops. Uh, it can be how we implement a, an algorithm or whatever it is, a spelling mistake if we don't use any tooling that can detect that before the program is running in our dynamical type language. Um, and I think a really, really interesting uh, concrete way when we have this disconnect is, is when we are debugging, right? And I think many of you will, will kind of recognize what I'm gonna describe now. So when you have, you have the task that you're about to fix. You're about to fix some bug or an issue in your code. You know where the issue is roughly. You know that there's, you know, it is in this function, 20 lines of code or something. Why you know that? I don't know. Perhaps you found out by some clever debugging. Perhaps your colleague told you or you have a crash, a core dump or something. You know it's in there, but you have spent two hours now just staring at the code. You can't figure out why it doesn't work. Perhaps you've included a few print statements or log statements, whatever it is. You can't really figure it out. Um, and you, you go through the code, and you typically try to interpret it in your head, right? You, we often talk to ourselves. Have, have you noticed that? But we don't really open our mouth when we do it. But we talk to ourselves. Yeah, you know, this is going to be. You know, we do that in a high, uh, or do you do that? Is it only me, perhaps? You do that. Some people are nodding. We talk to ourselves. We try to verify our assumptions in our heads. Um, so we, we try to interpret the program, but we typically don't find it anyways. So we might, find a, we might ask a colleague, a friend, to come sit by us and, you know, can I please tell? tell you what this code does because I can't find issue. Perhaps you can, you can help me finding the issue. And he, whoops, he or she says, uh, sure, I'm going to do that. And uh, sits down. And, and you just start talking out loud. You start telling line by line what the code does. Um, you will typically spend like two minutes or something just reading it out. So var x equals the function. And I send this tuple, whatever it is, a hash. Uh, I get it back, and then I index it, and then I, I reduce and you just stop. Your friend doesn't say anything, but you just notice what the issue is. Because when you're talking it out loud, and you, you, you're describing it to someone else, you need to kind of stop relying on your own assumptions. You're only verifying your own assumptions over and over again when you're reading it through yourself, right? Instead now you know that your colleague doesn't have the same context here, so you need to describe it in a bit better detail or whatever it is. But you might find it. There's a technique for that, it's called rubber duck computing. Everyone tried rubber duck computing? 
You replace your friend with a rubber duck, and it actually works. It's, it's very, very sick. The brain actually doesn't really help you all the time. We can read this, right? According to recent research, the human brain is perfectly able to read complex passages of text. That is hardcore. Our brain just does that for us, right? Um, so the trick here is that you keep the first and last uh, character fixed, and then you can swap the other ones around. And the brain, through pattern matching, and error correction will try to fix it for it, and it actually does. This is a really good thing often. It's sometimes a bad thing. When we are coding, when we are reading th through our code that doesn't really work, this can be a bad thing because the brain might actually mask it for us. A good example is loop indices. When you have nested loops, like a for loop, an i, and a j, perhaps a k, wow, that's like an o and three loop or something. Um, and you have like a spelling mistake, so you have i, 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 but then you have j, j, i, and your brain might actually mask that for you so you can't find it. Why am I saying all this? That's the map of Zelda, by the way. So why am I saying all this? Well, I think what I'm coming to is that we need to think about how we write our programs. And as important as choosing the, you know, the shiny language, whatever it is, languages are rarely shiny, but the shiny library, the shiny framework, uh, using the shiny technique, the, new, the, newest, um, the newest agile technique. We started doing Scrum you know, aggressively like five years ago, and now everybody seems to be doing Lean or Kanban, or both. Uh, I don't know. We need to also spend a lot of thing, time, I think, about how do we really um, optimize our code for being easier to reason about. Um, and especially now, because we are scaling like mad, right? We're scaling our program sizes and our team sizes. So I spend a fair amount of time now in the JS community, and the JS guys are really scaling their programs, right? It used to be super small, like tiny hacks, and now the programs are really, really big. Um, Many are writing programs that are executing more or less exclusively on the client, so, so really fat client programs where the server is only uh, a data store more or less. So I mean, we have really scaled this in terms of code base line size, but also in terms of team size. There are many people working on the same thing. Um, there is no sil silver bullet for this. You know, how do we make our programs easy to reason about? Um, we need to implement a bunch of practices uh, and good techniques, um, such as writing modules, of course. It always works, whatever language you're using. Break your problem down into different dis discrete modules. Prioritize spending a lot of time designing the APIs for those so that the APIs are sound. Make sure that you don't really intermingle data uh, more than necessary, um, that kind of stuff. We can also, like, if you're on a bigger team, then we, we need to think about stuff like style guides. How do we write our code? If you've ever done C++, you know all, all about the style guide wars. Uh, in the Python community, I think there's quite a good of consistency in terms of how we write Python code, right? Because there's even a pep for it. Uh, in the Ruby community, I think it's fairly consistent too. In the JS community, there's, you know, this, wow, this is crazy war about where do we put our semicolons? Or we shouldn't use them. Or we should use triple equals or double equals. People are a bit crazy about that. Um, but we really need to think about that in a team, right? Uh, we need to think about the subset of the language we use. I'm going to talk more about subsetting JS here, because everybody are actually using a subset, and it might help being able to formalize that a bit and using tools for it. Um, the core design principles of our program, you know, what are the core values of this library that we have designed or this program that we designed? You know, why does it look the way, you know, is it designed by accident or did you really think about it? And if we thought about it, what are the core principles? Can those be Document us somehow. Can we make sure that we share the, the, those core values and core principles among the entire team? And when we get new team members on board, how do we make sure that they pick up the same ideas? I think that's really, really, uh, when you look as an outsider into a community, I think it's really easy to tell whether the, the core team of that community or that project have you know, this shared mindset uh, of, of the problem they are trying to solve. It's really, you, know, you, you can really kind of notice, it's observable, observable that focus. Okay, um, to, to make this a bit more concrete, I said that this talk was really an ode to assert, so I'm gonna spend some, some fair time talking about assert now. Um, how many here use assert on a daily basis, almost? Wow, that is so few hands, I'm almost shocked. Really, you don't write any tests? Okay, but some, some assert similar um, mechanism at least, okay. Uh, so forget test now. How many use asserts, but not in or not in their test suite, but in their just regular code base? Three per four does that. Okay. So that's what I'm going to talk about now. How do you kind of inline your asserts in your in your standard code? We do that. So assert is an, uh, is typically a statement. You give it an assumption, which is an expression, and the only thing it does is that it tests whether that is truthy. You know, no matter what your 
language, you know, consider truthness and falseness. You check whether it's truthy. If it's truthy, nothing happens. So therefore, your, your assumption should never have any side effects. Um, if it's falsy, then it either crashes or it raises some exception. It depends on you know, how you want to do things. This originated back in, I think, back in AFL. Uh, it was kind of born in, in the sign by contract, which is trademarked, by the way. So we're not allowed to say the sign by contract. So I'm just going to say the DBC. Um, it was picked up you know, later, so I'm an, a C guy, C++ guy, so we used to do, you know, we used Asserter for, for a lot of times um, and used that as a macro using the C uh, preprocessor. You are, you know, we are still using it in other languages today, but I think that we are mostly focused on using Asserts for our test suites, and we could, in a dynamic type language, we could kind of improve ourselves by using it for other code as well. The intention with Asserts is really simple. You know, here is my assumption. This is what needs to be true at this point of time or this line of code in my function for the other thing to work. If this is not true, then I cannot take any responsibility of that. It's kind of similar to uh, a type system, a static type system, but more lax you know, and more free. It's very dynamic and it executes at runtime instead of compile time. Um, it's not a replacement for error handling, you know, like user, you know, user input and how to handle errors with that, but it's about the assumptions. So when you're, e you know, you are still going to read through your code and write it down and say, you know, yeah, for this to happen, that needs to, to be true. You might even write a few comments about that, but a cert is a way to, to document that in, in code, to codify it and to have it verified each time the program runs. And it makes your program fail faster. Here are just three different examples of how it could look. Uh, the first could be assert object state is free. It could be that we write kind of a, a memory pool, an object pool or something, a memory allocator. We reuse an object and we just want to verify, you know, this is free now. You know, this, it should really be free. I, I shouldn't really, you know, need to test this, but I'm just going to do that anyway. It can really be helpful when you start refactoring your code and, you know, shit breaks. So, so this is not true any longer because you get a fail fast. Arguments length triple equals two, that's a JS thing. Why would everyone do that? I do that when I refactor my JS code. When I change the, the signature of my functions so that they take one more, one less uh, parameter, I find it really, really helpful to add this, at least if I don't support any optional arguments in that JS function. I find it uh, really helpful to add this to, to that function. Because often I notice is when I refactor my code like that, like that I, I forget about one or two call sites. And instead of getting an undefined from there, you know, I'm going to see uh, an assert um, fire as soon as that co is, is called. You could also do it as like a poor man's type system at runtime. You know, okay, so cast really needs to be a number, and by the way, it can't be a nan. It can't be a, a, a plus or minus infinity. Uh, that can be helpful too. Um, so assert is available in many languages. In JS, we don't really have assert. We can, of course, implement it with a functional three lines of code or something. But one of the kind of good properties about old school assert is that it should, either in your exception or in your log, it should print the, the string representation of the expression that failed, uh, preferably with a line and, and uh, the file name. Um, so for doing that in JS, we need some kind of macro facilities. Uh, there's a link there to to some stuff I wrote to fix that in JS. So what happens? With assert, we get code that's easy to reason about because now we have documented our assumptions. It's definitely gonna be more robust because it fails fast as soon as those assumptions are, aren't true any longer. And you know what? When people start maintaining that code, it might not be you any longer. It might be your colleague that starts maintaining it. It's gonna be better quality because they are gonna be able to read through the assumptions and add a few assumptions of their own in asserts. Uh, it absolutely simplifies, simplifies refactoring and code changes for the same reasons. It makes it easier to write unit tests. This is pretty interesting. Because if you go all the way, you know, hardcore with asserts, you start asserting your input, you assert your invariance in your function, and you even start asserting your, your output, your, your return value. That is what design by contract is all about, by the way. I'm not suggesting that we should do that, but if you do that, or if you do it to you know, some kind of extreme, uh, then you might find that your unit test can be more focused on just testing the function with data. They don't, they don't need to do any, you know, ver verify the return value or anything like that. They can just motion your code with values. Uh, and it doesn't slow you down. If you haven't used a lot of asserts uh, in your code uh, previously and you're afraid that it might slow you down, then, then if it slows you down, then you're doing things wrong. Absolutely. It shouldn't slow you down at all. It should speed you up. Going to JS in, in you know, particular, there are some assumptions yammer in JS for me. Uh, all languages have these. Python have those, Ruby 2, all languages have their less beautiful parts, whatever it is, and JS has for sure. So just a few examples that I find a bit 
you know, annoying and assumption jammers for me. Undefined and null, we have two of them in JS, not one. Uh, we have box types that work horribly bad with primitive types. It's really a design mistake. Uh, we have function scope instead of block scope, which is a huge assumption jammer if you came from C, C++, or any other language with you know, curly braces and, uh, and the notion of block scope. We have the global pollution, which used to be a big problem. It's slightly, you know, slightly lesser problem right now because we have ECMAScript 5 strict mode, but we still have you know, a lot of things on our global objects. If you're in the browser, you're going to have name defined at the top level. You know, that's pretty annoying for me. I have, you know, just a few months ago, I had a bug in my code because I had this top level name. We have a self too for the Pythonistas in here. We have a self, top level self in JS. Now, I found that out two week, weeks ago or something. It's really annoying. And we can't really get rid of those. They are defined on the window object. Um, false values. We have so many of them in JS, but so have you in Ruby and Python often. You know, it depends. But we have many of them in JS. And if we are polyglot, it's also a bit annoying that we have different false values, right? So like the empty list in JS is truthy, the empty list in Ruby is truthy, the empty list in Python is false. Yeah, it's like, you know, we have these differences and, and it, you know, just the way the things are. JS keeps on running, it never crashes. It just keeps on running and, you know, tries to give you something instead of failing fast. Um, and we can mix strings and numbers in arithmetic, in arithmetic operations, which sounds very convenient, but isn't. So plus, by the way, um, plus, I tried to do some research about plus and string concatenation, uh, so feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but according to my research, we started using plus for string concatenation in addition to number arithmetics back in 1968 with Algol, Algol 68. So I'm just gonna say that as some kind of truth statement and feel free to bash me, but that's when it started. That's a horrible mistake, of course, because uh, number addition and string concatenation doesn't share many properties, you know, you can, you can, you can swap the side, swap the sides of two numbers. You can't do that with two strings. There's really no good reason at all to, to reuse the same operator, but it's just the way the things are. So I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna hate on that too much. But in JS, plus has this keep on running thing. You know, you can give me anything, and I will give you something in return. You can give me a null. You want to give me a null and undefined? Sure, I'm gonna give you a nan. Now you're gonna, you want to give me false and empty list? Sure, I'm gonna give you something. Um, let me fix that for you. Keep on running. And you know what? I, absolute, I am absolutely convinced that weak typing in a dynamically typed language, that is just awful. It's a horrible, horrible idea. It's a design mistake. And it's going to be looked upon in the future similar to how uh, dynamic uh, st scope, as opposed to lexical scope, you know, most people consider that a, mistakes, a mistake. It was something that was introduced, I think, more or less in the lisps, uh, but then, then corrected. So weak typing. What I mean with weak typing in this context is that it's kind of queerish and happy, right? That's what I mean. Uh, so like Ruby and Python are both examples of much, much stronger type language than JS because they are n neither of them are very queerish and happy. And if they are, then at least you can control it uh, by, uh, by code semantics. In JS, there are some built-in semantics that are horribly broken uh, and it's not very helpful at all. And I think for JS guys, it's really important to, to kind of acknowledge the fact that we are different. JS is different here compared to almost everything else out there. Perhaps that should be fixed somehow or remediated at least. So for A plus B, what happens? Well, A and B needs to be converted to primitives. So undefined null, Boolean number string, that's primitives. We do that by calling value of and two string in that order. Unless we have a date, then we swap the order because we care so much about date. Wow. Uh, if at least one of them is a string, then we need to convert into strings and concatenate them, else we convert both to numbers and add them. Ah, so we do implicit something to number conversion in language. That is pretty awful, right? That's a recipe for disaster. My head exploded the first time I learned that. Triple equals in JS is yours to keep. There's this huge debate, but you know, it's yours to keep. Where is my triple plus? Where is my plus with same semantics? Where is my plus that says do only addition, nothing more, or string calculation? Don't do any, any weird stuff. And by the way, JS has this full magic hat of surprises. All these operators tries to take anything and gives you anything in, uh, back, which is really weird. So I'm suggesting, what if we could restrict the hat to something less surprising? Let's say that for a top row, that should only be able to take strings or number, never a mix, okay? Plus, let's give it string, strings or number. We can mix them because sometimes we wanna do string plus number and we, in the JS world, we do that to do uh, string formatting at the same time. It's very common in other languages too. For everything else, numbers. Why should they be allowed to do with anything else than two numbers? And if not, let's fail. So we can change plus semantics, so perhaps we can convince people to, to call dunderad instead and have a dunderad that does type assertions like that. 
Uh, it would make our programs very, very awkward to write. So perhaps we can change plus after all. He said five just 36 ago, so I'm going to trust him. Uh, so restrictmodel.org um, slash try. You can go there, and then you can write your code, and you're going to see translated code at the right. Uh, and this translated code is going to look very, very similar to my original code now. It's going to look the same. Um, whoops. So you see now the translated code is the same. So this is just JavaScript code and print this console lock. If you run this, you know, the average of those two are one, uh, one and a half right. Okay, looks sane, right? In JS, we can, we can uh, mix numbers and strings freely. Uh, and JS does the right thing for us. So we can do uh, number one and string two, and we're still going to have one and a half, except that we don't. We've got six. Right. You know what happens because we have uh, the number one plus uh, string two becomes the string 12. The string 12 divided by two becomes. So I mean, it's just a mess. And uh, so what I did with restrict mode is that similar to ES5 strict, I did use restrict. You can do this in a function or top level. And now you see that you have a translator that replaces your, your operators with function calls, the dundrads and similar, and we have type checking in there. So if we run this program, then bam, restrict mode, division, code with string and number. So it, fi it finds it for you while you're developing your code. Um, hopefully, restrict mode is a subset of, you know, it's, it's, it's the subset of JS you're already using. The idea is that I promise to limit myself to the subset. I use a checker that I just showed. Uh, I write tests just like before, and it fails fast whenever I break this, the subset. And the good thing is that since the semantics I have defined is a subset, it's a pure subset of the standard JS uh, semantics, we can deploy the original program. We can just deploy the original program. Nobody needs to know we use restrict mode to, to develop it. It's easier to reason about because it's easier to, to, when we try to fix bugs, it's easier to understand what can happen in an operation. And I guess one question to ask, is this the right subset? Is this a subset we should all start, you know, start using? But I, because I think there would be value if we could agree in the JS community about using some kind of common subset for our code. Well, I tried it with a few different programs and libraries and just you know, looked at what happens if I said use restrict for the entire program. I run the test suite and I see what fails. What is going to fail then is not going to be bugs in their programs, likely, but it's going to be a subset mismatch. They wanted to use something that I forbid and excluded in restrict mode. I did it for VHPins, for Kraken, for jQuery, JSLint, and it was uh, a rocking yes. It's a good subset. You know, just five lines of code or something for each and every code base. I found a bug in jQuery, which, which is now fixed. That was really unexpected. In JSLint, I found a really bad practice, but Crockford didn't agree, so let's just call it a debatable practice. Um, in VHBench, I found uh, a bad practice. This is, so Reflect Mode works under the hood by a framework called JS Shaper. It's a source to source translation engine for JavaScript that I wrote uh, a year and a half ago. MIT licensed on jshaper.org and GitHub, so you can go and play with it. It runs in the browser, it runs in Node. You can run on the fly in the browser even, but I would recommend it to include it in your tool chain and just execute it, execute it using Node. Um, yeah, so if you want to use Restrict, go to that web page, download JS Shaper, put it in your tool chain. If you don't want to use it you know, all the time when you're, when you're running your program, perhaps you are one of those guys that hate, hate the tool chains, at least consider using it before running your test suite, because that's going to take a while anyway. So run it, you know, run a translated test suite. It doesn't cost you anything. There's no lock in. You can just remove use Restrict. Nobody needs to know you went there at the first place, because it's still just JavaScript. So last minute, to wrap things out about easy to reason about in a global sense for all languages. So choose your subset and style guide. You know, we, should be, we are adults, so we should be able to, to come up with whatever our subsets ourselves, but at least consider choosing it. Use tools to help verify those. Consider sprinkling assertions in your code. Prioritize getting your APIs right. It's really easy to say, but it's really hard to do. Challenge your assumption, and remember that reading code is a skill, so we need to keep practicing it and learn from others. My time is up, and that's all I had. And also have fun whenever you're coding. That's why we're coding anyways. Thank you. And we are out of time, right? So I'm going to stay here to be able to take questions uh, if you have any. <laughs>